had a heavy genealogy. Slavery, the void of cultural maintenance. We a heavy genealogy. We had a heavy genealogy. Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, even though I came to introduce uh, to you briefly, and then it'll be a formal introduction, I couldn't help resist telling you that I struggled and tried poetry myself. And I participated in a recitation many times, only to realize I couldn't get there where I wanted to, so I cho chose science as a career. But to date, I have immense respect and love for poetry. And before we go to the topic, let me share with you something. The power of the pen, now that nobody uses a pen, this is your laptops. But the power of poetry is so immense. Consider a poet who wrote some poetry in praise of people, culture, language, and that led to creation of two national anthem of two different countries. I'm talking of Tagore, India's first poet laureate, 1913. He wrote poems that people sing. There is actually in Bengal of India. Had he written English, people will think of him in the same light as Shakespeare. He wrote in local language, Bangla, and Bengalis, which Calcutta is their main area where Mother Teresa worked, people are so proud of the language and their culture, and they all learned this through his poetry. 
So when Bangladesh was liberated or became a nation, they chose his song as their national anthem. That's the power of poetry. Another nation, the largest democracy in the world, the most English-speaking nation in the world, India, its national anthem was also penned by Ravindranath Tagore. That's the power of poetry. So we are here to celebrate another giant among us, Thalia Moss. She's a professor of English at the University of Michigan. And I look forward to ever since I learned that she would be here, want to be part of it, and, and, and listen and experience her work. From 1983 to today, she's authored many books of poems. And the most recent that you see here, uh, it, it's been put in a uh, worse that it could have a broader appeal to readers of poetry and verse and language. And, and I hope you will take advantage uh, to get a book if you can and experience and enjoy that piece of literature. Another thing that I wanted to point out in my role uh, as president of the university, very important, we treat all disciplines alike. Just like a mom, all the kids are same, alike. Engineering, architecture, business, and then College of Arts and Sciences. But the foundation is always the liberal arts. There was an article in Chronicle of Higher Education. I want to bring it to your attention that never consider one discipline is any less than the other. They have all their own importance. There was an article in Chronicle of Higher Education a couple of months ago. In that, bravado to Lawrence Tech. The author cited that engineers should be learning liberal arts to become good engineers, to become good leaders. And in that, they only cited three universities in the country that actually support liberal arts in engineering program. We were one of the three in the country. I think that needs an applause. And why? Because today is the reflection. The reason you have gathered here is to show your love and respect for the poetry, for the literature. And I believe whoever is the CEO of a, a business uh, organization or an engineering corporation, if they do not have sound liberal education, love for literature, history, the knowledge of history, the communications, if you member of CEO of a company with 20,000 or more employees, how are you communicating with them what the company is all about? That comes from liberal arts. So I'm very proud to be here. In the slave moth that you say, it's a narrative and verses and only talk for a broader audience. But the more important thing I notice reading about her, she is very student focused. And Lawrence Tech is all about students, all of us, Whatever our roles are, we are focused in educating students so they can be leaders. And her work impressed me because she is focused. And she challenges her students, as I read her quote from an interview. She challenges them to reach their limit of imagination, of their power. Don't settle less than that. I think that is making of leaders. So. I also will mention that I have known some other people who have achieve eminence of the order she has, which is the MacArthur Fellowship. MacArthur Fellowship in literature is the same as Nobel Prize in chemistry. This is very, very big thing. Guggenheim Fellowship she has received. So you have with you today somebody who is very prominent, a great contributor to literature. And I, particularly the student, you'll be enriched by learning, reading her book, uh, reading her work and communicating with her, speaking with her, because these are good memories. She's a powerful leader in literature, and it's my privilege to be with you and listen to her work today. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Mogill. So I'm just going to say a few words about Thylias, and, and, um, and we will begin. So, yes? Thylias is, <laughs> one reason I love her is not just because of her amazing poetry, but also that we're the same size. <laughs> so Thylias was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1954. She earned a BA from Oberlin College and an MA. 
<laughs> and an MA from the University of New Hampshire. And she's a prolific creative writer. And her books of poetry include Slave Moth, a narrative in verse, which you have an opportunity to purchase today and have her sign it. Last Chance for the Tarzan Holler, Small Congregations, New and Selected Poems, Rainbow Remnants and Rock Bottom Ghetto Sky, At Red Bones, Pyramid of Bones, Hosiery Seams on a Bow-Legged Woman, Tokyo Butter, and Two Plays Talking to Myself, and Dolls in the Basement. Her forthcoming volume of poetry, and it's a fabulous title, <laughs> Wannabe Hoochie Mama, Gallery of Realities, Red Dress Code, New and Selected Poems by Thylias Moss, will be out in 2016 from Percy Books. And as President Maud Gill noted, she's won numerous honors, including a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, a DeWars Profiles Performance Award, a Witter Binner Award for Poetry, and a Whiting Award. She is a national treasure. We are so lucky to have her here. She's a major contributor to American Letters. She's a professor emeritus from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. So I just want you to hold on to your seats and prepare to be electrified, moved, and inspired by this amazing woman, Thylias Moss. So we're just gonna walk around, so just give us a minute and we'll be on stage. Thank Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the um, Project Genealogy you saw. Uh, I, I had to go to a meeting at my son's school. He's 24 now. Um, I don't usually go to meetings because I don't behave well when I go to meetings. But I was persuaded to go. And it turned out that this was a meeting where parents wanted to eliminate an, uh, um, a genealogy assignment. And I'm listening to this, and one mother, in fact, at the end of the film, you may have noticed that it said, for Gooch. It was Gooch's mother who was the most vocal at the meeting, and she, she was demanding that the, the head of school, um, he was supposed to be called the headmaster. Now, I'm sorry, as a person whose heritage is partially descended from slaves, I do not acknowledge anyone as my master and certainly not the white man at that school, absolutely not. But, um, you know, so I went to the meeting anyway, and it turned out that these parents did not want the genealogy assignment because Gucci's mother said her son would be so embarrassed because all he would do, he would have to stop at slavery. He didn't know his ancestors beyond that. It was all murky and, and, and confused. Now I'm at this meeting. And I'm thinking, this does not make sense, because my son was only in sixth grade. He had written an ancestry poem, which I happen to have right here. I'm going to read it. He's not in the room. It's a good thing. He would be very upset if he knew. So ancestry poem. And it says, every boy, everyone came from a single cell a vast time ago. Imagine specks coming to life in the oceans or planets never to be seen. Every one of us evolved from stardust into the form we take on now. Looking at space through telescopes at the next generation of stardust, that will breathe. Now I'm listening to this, and they want this assignment eliminated. And I'm thinking, well, not a good idea. And I'm, I'm as quiet as I could be. Mind you, I did not intend to go to this meeting. I don't even know why I went. I don't remember now. But finally, I couldn't take it any longer. And so I said, my son is only in sixth grade. And he traced his ancestry all the way back. And I paused dramatically. All the way back to the Big Bang. Slavery was not a problem. <laughs> and I was all for keeping the assignment because I realized from that that the problem was not slavery. The problem was how they failed to use imagination in thinking about it. And so, when I got home, I knew what I had to do. So I immediately set out to write that book. 
because I needed to create an image of slavery that was different from the one they had. Obviously, their imaginations were not working to do that. I had no intention of writing this book. I just went to a meeting at my son's school. And when I got home, I had to begin to write it. So I said, what if I remove all their problems with slavery? What if I have a literate slave? What if I remove those problems? What if I have a female, a female who can read and write? Let's remove those problems so that the only problem she had was that she was owned. And that's the problem with slavery. Not that someone could read or write. The problem is ownership. You cannot be owned by someone else. I'm sorry. And so I had to remove all of those issues. I had to create a character who, who was removed from that. And you see, the character's name is Barl, B-A-R-L. Notice how that word is derived from larva, something that is going to undergo complete metamorphosis. That is the idea. And so that, that's who Barl is. Barl is, and because Barl is literate, you see, so the only thing holding her back one, it's being a, a woman in the South, and not only a woman, but a woman of color in the South at a time when she was supposed to belong to men, right? And, and this is at a time when if you were married, you were the property of your husband, and the, the, the wife of, of, of Barl's owner, um, Peter Perry, um, his wife, who was a, a white woman, could not read or write. She didn't have to. Her, her purpose was to get married, to marry into wealth, so she would be taken care of. She was not expected to be able to take care of herself. She shouldn't, she shouldn't even want to become anything other than someone's wife. That's her, that was her goal, that was her ambition, to become a wife. I don't think I was a good wife. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm divorced now. Anyway, <laughs> um, but so you see, I had to create a character that would be different from that. I had to remove those problems and show that the problem was ownership, nothing else. Even if you removed everything else, slavery was not a good system because she did not belong to herself. And so I needed to duplicate um, the condition she had. And so the, the character Barl sews on pieces of cloth. And she, she's not using electricity. She does this in the dark at night. And no one knows this because it was not legal for her to be able to read and write. Hmm? And so as she's sewing these pieces of cloth, initially they're hidden under her dress. But eventually, they're, they're too big to hide. And so it becomes a garment she has to wear in the exterior. And so I wanted to, so in the dark, by hand, I made this dress, I made it completely, because I needed to know what it would be like. I wanted to try to know what it would be like for my character. I did a lot of research to know what Tennessee was like in, in, in the 1850s. But the important thing was the making it by hand. Then I went and I got the American, because I thought that was appropriate, an American girl doll, 18, American, 18 inches tall, so I made the dress to fit her. And then I got her, I put the dress on her, and I deliberately wanted her to have some kind of hair that looked like a mixture of hair. That's the one thing that, you know, that's, as, as a little girl growing up, I always had, because I'm from a mixed race background, the hair always got me in, in trouble. And let me tell you, one thing that I have not liked more recently, because now hair is just an accessory. You can have any kind of hair you want. You can buy the hair you want. You can get the texture you want. Not mine. Mine is rooted to my, I have so much trouble trying to explain. This is my hair. This is the way it looks. It is natural this way. I have so much trouble. And sometimes it bothers me because you can't distinguish my hair from the hair someone has purchased. Usually from, not from this part of the world so that they can get the texture they want. Oh, dear. So I have a thing about that too. I have all kinds of problems with many things, and I write about them. <laughs> and that has been my, that, oh. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, but that has been my, my, uh, my problem all along. Um, and well, I'm going to read Delicacies, which is the first poem in um, um, Slave Moth. Now, the, the, oh, there's Barl on the screen. There she is. Yes, yes. And, that's, and you can see the dress that I made, and, it, and you should read it, and it has some lines from this. So now I will read Delicacies. Okay. 
My master is a collector. Rare things delight him. Deformity peaks in him an unwholesome joy that encourages repeated fellowship with curiosity that will not cease until he himself has milked every animal with more than or less than the right number of anything, roasting their hearts and liver for himself only, making himself sicker with delicacy and only delicacy to which he has a devotion. He has called it succulents, which he was tempted to call me when my birth caused the death of his horse, Varro, the succulents of that power, snake bite and misery. Kentucky racehorse dropped dead by the fence at the precise moment of my first cry in my first darkness outside Mama Lee. Varro, whose name became mine, though not enough, maybe none at all, of her tame spirit. So I, Varro Perry, delight him even more. Peter Thomas Perry might prefer if it were me outlined in anatomical charts made by his hand of one good eye and three-legged pigs he got cheap at auction in Chattanooga when the last of the Cherokee were leaving, though he would have sold his soul. <laughs> the smokehouse was already, where is it, crowded with ham and sausage when he succumbed to his science, his private bacon renderings, private batch of soap made for him from deformed hog fat by his slave, albino pearl. He liked her because she was an albino, something else unusual, as rare as me. Also acquired at auction, white African she's called when Peter Perry wants quick money from lookers, quick to pay it. I've seen it happen. Something amazing is behind such things. He loathes, fears, desires it, something tantalizing, paralyzing. He left his great book of insectian marvels on his desk open to the page on Actius Luna, moths flying at night like green angels of the insects. And this morning, as I clean the room that is a torture chamber for his illiterate wife, Rawls Janet, that's an apple, you know. She was named after an apple because she was from a family who made their wealth from an orchard and by, by um, converting the apples into whiskey. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I read about how Luna Mars commit all their energy to finding a mate. They don't have much time, less than a week for a life, soundless. They don't have mouths, ears, don't have to eat, don't take any orders except from their own nature, all under darkness. What do they matter? Pale green stars falling into my hands, obedient to, to luring odors, the smell of something within themselves, compelling scent, connects them. Master Perry, wanted me to see that page, expected my interest to peek upon my learning how the lunar larva makes itself a cocoon. Is that not what her dress is, a cocoon? Think about it. She's got her own words sewed under it, that she's got a protection between herself and the outside world, her own words. That is what strengthens her, her own words, her own thoughts, her own ideas, and she's sewing them on cloth. Do you know it takes much longer to sew your words than to just write them? So this is very deliberate. Understand how painstaking this is, the length of time involved to write this. I wanted the, the, the font for the whole book to look like stitching. The publisher said, no, it would be too confusing. But that misses the point. Every poem in there is as if she sewed it. That's how it's supposed to be. I wanted it to look like stitching. The publisher said, no. But I, and I have to thank my son for the title because I was giving it some ridiculous title like The Battle of Barleton. My son said, well, you know, it's about a, it's about a moth. He said, call it Slave Moth. So I did. <laughs> All right, so, so where was I? Okay, oh yes. How can it, oh, let, let me read this again. Okay, ha uh ha. -huh. Okay, Master Perry wanted me to see that Age, expected my interest to peek upon my learning how the lunar larva makes itself a cocoon of silky parts, papery parts, 
inside of which it writes itself a new existence and changes to fit it. Larva goes in, Actius Luna comes out. Learning more and more about how to be his slave. What can I do with insectian information? What can I do with it? How can it take on value for a slave? How can it matter? What circumstances can it change? I'm a rare thing, and my reading amuses Master Perry. The speed with which I reach out and grab onto understanding, I am just lucky if a slave can have luck that such a man as Peter Perry demanded an experiment with reading, curious about how well could a black girl do it. I am his experiment. Me benefiting from great minds and arguments he was exposed to in college out east near Chesapeake interrupted when he inherited this farm and had ideas that still include Mama Lee reading to him and reciting to him in moonlight, talking books in the woods, classics. Raw Janet, his wife, not close enough to make out words in the distance where it sounds like buzzing, rumors of war. I can see what's happening to her. There is deformity in this arrangement too. Can't do any of this in the open since Rawls Janet came here as his bride nine years ago, she hated what she took to be the ranking. Peter Perry, Mama Lee, me, Rawls Janet, in the hierarchy of intelligence. In her experience, what went on here, place um, Peter Perry was calling Perrysburg, Tennessee, should mean the punishment and death of us. There were not many who could approve, especially among Peter Perry's in-laws and relatives, especially Rawls Janet, who, wouldn't, who couldn't appreciate the oddity that her presence expanded. You see, she was part of the collection too. She didn't realize it. She didn't know. Wow, dear. My power over her, that I can read in her behavior. I used to sleep right outside the master's bedroom door. All his, all the, all his slaves in his house till she came and ordered me into a cabin. She persuaded her husband to have his slaves built. <laughs> the one of her requests he, he honored. It amuses Master Perry when his Rawls Janet watches how little reading has done for me. Bob, who for all her intelligence is just a slave, still a slave. No better off it would seem. She saw me this morning, and as I left the room, I saw her tracing over the lunar drawing with her finger that wasn't quite as fat as a lunar larva. She's gotten quieter and quieter, unintentionally emphasized the larva. She did me a favor. You can fit all of my name, Val, into lava. You can fit all of my name into something that undergoes complete, complete metamorphosis. So did I. Starting tonight, starting tonight, I won't write any more of my thoughts on paper, though I did like to steal it from the master. Rawls Janet, especially perturbed by, by, by that, to the amusement of her husband. Starting tonight, on cloth, I stitch my words. <laughs> the larva drawing me, drawing its silk back and forth through squares of cloth that will be the lunar wings, dozens of specimens stitched together, connected into a cocoon I can wear under my dress, those first squares pinned across my chest to change my heart. The next, com the next comes, comes to, the next one's to be the underside of my scarf, the, those days I choose to tie my hair to change my mind and then keep it from changing back. <laughs> Lunas don't give up their wings and become caterpillars again, eating all the time, as insatiable as Peter Perry. All Luna underneath the visible bar. So that anybody who sees me, even Master Perry, who lately looks at me too long, invested me with his evening so that he's in the mental picture he carries of me, bending over his book, finding my destiny in the book left for me to find it. Peter Perry, master of my destiny. He can hold on to me in the worst ways. And that is the end of Delicacies. There is more, lots more in the book. I am probably way off schedule.
questions because um, one of the reasons I wanted to invite Thylius is that she um, integrates technology into her creative practice. And, um, and so I thought it would be a really good opportunity to maybe ask her some questions about the and, use of and, technology. And, and, and may I just say, yeah. you know, I, 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 heard, I heard those words you were saying about integrating the different disciplines. I was one of those unusual persons where, you know, I ended up in English because that's where my lowest grade was, so I thought I should pursue English, which was my weakest subject. But I got an A or an A-plus in every other subject. <laughs> English was a choice because I wanted to master what I wasn't good at. Everything but English was a choice. Yes, yes. But what I'm trying to say is that I, got I wanted to offer a version of English that wasn't only for English majors. I wanted it to be for anybody. And that's where my idea for making things came, you see? So my, my thought also had to do with, I'm thinking of deprivation of the senses. If you can't see it, maybe you can hear it. So that, that was my idea. With the dress, you can touch it. So it was the, where I had the most trouble was with the all factory. So for, for one installation, we popped popcorn so we could smell that. And then we ate it so that we could get that involved. But the, 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 point, the point is that I didn't want English only for English majors because everybody should be able to write and everyone has something to say. And so I wanted to develop a way of saying things. You see, I, 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 my university was opposed to me because I was trying to do something that was unheard of. This is long before the interdisciplinary bandwagon. So you see, I started this thing where I wanted students from any place in the university to be able to come in. So what, this wasn't the first piece I made, but you see, when I made it, when I made my first piece, I ran to the Department of English and I said to the chair, look at what I made, I was so excited. The first piece I made, you can see on my, my YouTube channel, uh, which is the Forker Girl channel. Anyway, the, the first piece I made was the Song of Iota. I made it an iMovie because that is what I had. My point is, use what you have. I had iMovie, so I wanted, and I didn't want to use iMovie the way you were instructed to use it. I wanted to see what could I make iMovie do. And I, I, say, I think you run into trouble. I always ran into trouble. When you just follow the rules. And you see, the people we admire, the so-called trailblazers, how do they become trailblazers? They made rules. They didn't follow them. And that's what I try to do also. Make rules for myself. Not about, oh, I was a terrible wife, that poor man. Oh, absolutely. And within digital humanities, that's very much part right, of the Right, right. Well, you see, so, e exactly. And so, I, when, I, when I make these things, I don't write them first. I make them in the application in which they will live. So the writing happened there. I didn't first write it and then make it. The writing happened there. And, and you see, so, um, after, it, English did not understand what I was doing. So it was when I went to the engineers. The engineers had no trouble. They, had, they said, oh, no problem. Yes, of course, we just apply poetry to this. The, the, in English, that's not how poetry was done. So they didn't understand it, but the engineers did. And so I was, I, I was relocated. So where I had my, my teaching was, was in this, it's called this collaborative space. So I, I taught in Design Lab 1, which had never been used for teaching. But what I liked about it is that the walls were glass so that people could see what we were doing. And I left the doors open so people could just wander in. Because my whole idea is that, talk about learning, I'm a learner too, and that's the whole point. So the, as soon as I got the idea, I changed my class. I said to the students, throw out everything you have done. I no longer believe it. I cannot teach that. We must do something else. We must learn together. The students loved it because I'm one of them. I don't know what this is. I want to see what I can do. I don't know. Could it, could it have failed? Absolutely. And I think we have to stop fearing failure because failure can be a good thing. Yeah? Because failure tells us we have to find another way to go. So I don't consider failure bad. You can, you can imagine the, the problem I had with students. Because I'm telling them, and they would always ask, what do I want? I would say, no. I said, it is your class. What do you want? Why are you here? What do you want to learn? It is not what I want. I've, I've done that. I've been to school. I was a good student. That doesn't matter. So it's not my class. It is your class. What do you want to learn? I wanted them to take responsibility for their learning. And I wanted them to, to not want to blame the so-called instructor. I'm a student, too. I'm a student of the world. I'm a student of life. This is the only life I've had. 
I have not had another. So whatever happens in it, I'm learning. And I have to have an opportunity to try to apply what I've learned. And I can't wait because I don't know how long I'm going to live. I might not live beyond today. So I think it's important to make what you can make, whatever it is. You don't have to know the solution. What I started teaching is something called limited fork. I don't have a fork right here, but you know what a fork looks like. So a fork has a handle. Your hand is a fork, is it not? So you have these wonderful times. What I love about forks would be the space between them. So you know when you use a fork to eat something, you're not going to get everything. Something is going to fall through the times. You know this at the outset. And I tell that to, to my co-students, my co-learners. We can't get everything. Let's make what we can with what we have. You cannot get everything. It is not possible. We don't even know what everything is. So how would we know we have it? To know what everything is would mean that you have some kind of knowledge beyond everything. Because the only way you could know it would be to look back at it. In, in retrospect, we can't do that. So we don't know what everything is yet. We don't have it yet. And so I don't like to write from that position of knowing. I write from a position of, I want to know. I make at a position of, I want to know. I know I'm not allowing you a chance for any questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting because um, with an, an engineer, one of the engineers had to do a, a project in virtual reality modeling language. And so I wrote something that he then um, turned into that, that I don't have that, that project with me. If I had known, I, I would have brought it. But, and also, in, I, it turned out that many of the engineers longed to express things. So you see, it was very easy for them to learn to use the applications. All they had to do was figure out what they had to say. And what I would tell them, you know, the other problem I had with, with education was this, the false deadlines, an idea that you could begin a project and end it within a semester. That is not possible. As a, as, as a maker, I don't make that way. And I, didn't, I wanted students to be able to take advantage of time. And so what I would say to them, whenever you get an idea, go with the idea. And what I wanted them to do was to just write down their plans. That's all, I, that's all I wanted them to submit, their plans. The plans were to be detailed. So you read, what do you think about? I, I wanted them to be able to integrate their entire lives because they weren't just a student of English, a student of, of engineering. They were a person, a single person went to all of these classes. Here was a place where you could put it all together, say whatever you have to say, whatever it is. And when you say it, we're going to find a way to say it so that we're, we're going to say it in these applications. Now, the application I started using for most of my projects was, was motion. And again, when I went to the engineers, and um, I don't even know how I knew to do this, but for some reason, um, we had a, a, a center at the University of Michigan, the Duderstadt Center of Engineering. So I asked to speak with Jim Duderstadt. And he, he, <laughs> he was there, and we had a wonderful meeting. And he was so excited by all of this. I mean, he, he just set me up with a, with a desk right in design lab. They said, where do you want to work? I said, design lab one. I said, do you have an application called motion? He said, yes, they do. I don't even know. You know, I knew they didn't have it in English. He said they did. And so he said, did I want to be taught? I said, no. I said, I will figure it out myself. Because again, I didn't want to learn how someone who had designed it, what they wanted it to do. I wanted to see what I could make it do. So I ended up with all these things I call poems, products of acts of making. Not P-O-E-M, because we know what that is. So I needed something where it wasn't already de defined. So it sort of sounds the same, but the difference is that it is what we, it's the product of what we make. What is it? We don't know. And getting back to time. So you see, I wanted them to submit their plans, which could be very detailed. That's where the most detail had to be. What would you like to do? What would you want to do if you had the time? So what I would tell them, I said, if it's 20 years from now, send it to me, whatever you've made. The idea was that it's their plan that I had them sub sub submit, not the finished product, their plan. What would you like to do? And the plans were wonderfully detailed. And you see, I only wanted students who would be willing to do the work because it's a lot of work. And so I would scare them away. I wanted as many to drop the class as possible. <laughs> so I would be left only with students who were dedicated and who could, who could teach them, who were willing to, to do the work to teach themselves. So many dropped, and I wanted them to. Because 
what I was left with was this core of people who really wanted to learn. Now, mind you, they had to believe me somehow that I was not going to grade them. They would always ask, what do you want? What do you want? What do you? And I would try to turn it around. It's not what I want at all. What do you want? So that they would be willing to work because it's the work that's important for them, not for me. It's their work, not mine, if that's helpful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We're starting on this project, and it's clearly going to take all year. Well, mm -hmm. We're so interested in it. Mm -hmm. we're, we only meet Monday and Wednesday evening. Mm -hmm. we're, we've been meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, to Thursday. We've been meeting so much to work on. This. That is fantastic. Yes, and it's. Uh, but you know, now I'm, I'm saying, can we just keep working next semester together? I know they want to, but this is the time. You know. And exactly. Then, well, you see, I. I. I digital days, it takes longer. It, 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 yes. I mean, they have to learn the application. Applications. You gotta learn the applications. And again, I try to eliminate a step by writing it first, write it yes. in the application. This is where it's going to live, so it's not going to be the same. Writing for paper is not the same as making something that is going to move. In fact, that's how I, I got the idea for this. I, I went to the, the, the cinema, I don't even remember which movie it was, but I'm looking at it differently, and then I, I noticed at the end, the credits. The credits were moving, and I, I, I think I'm the only person in the cinema, I'm standing up going, yes, look at that, the credits, they're moving. And that, that just transformed everything. I knew what to do. When I got home, that's when I used the iMovie and made the Song of Iota. It's 21 minutes long. If I don't know the answer, I'll say so. Yeah, believe me, yes. Uh, yes, please. Uh, what's your writing process like? What like writing do you do? You like find yourself in a room and write all day, or do you just like come see and write on a napkin? What do you do? Well, you know what I love about having my phone? It has notes. You see, so I try not to use paper. One, I don't like what happens to trees, and so I try to, mind you. There's another problem with what's used in the technology to, to, to make this stuff and the recycling of it, I know. But I have a, a special passion for the trees. Um, so I don't have um, a particular regimen, just I have ideas all the time. I have ideas right now. And, you know, and, and that's another thing that I started to say. When an idea comes to you, we will interrupt the class because you must write down your idea, do whatever it is. You must begin the making. And I also use tinker toys. So that is, I, I didn't care what the material was because the idea was that you, you make something. So for, for me, what are the makers? The wind is a maker, a storm is a maker. So everything is a maker, everything makes something. Yeah. And so I wanted to, to introduce the idea we are makers. No matter what we make, we are makers. And so you can make something out of whatever you like. It doesn't matter your material, but why are you using it? And so that's what I wanted them to think about, what, to have a reason for whatever you do. What is the reason you're going to do that? That's why I wanted the plans. You would like to make stuff out of, and you could change your mind. This was important. You could change your mind the day before it was due. It didn't matter. Just as long as you have a reason, what caused you to change your mind? What did you see? What did you think? What did you hear? What did you see in your travels and in life? What did you notice that caused you to change your mind? Again, I wanted them to be, this was the place where they could be that one person, that single, that one individual who does all these things, not having to be something else in each class, if that makes any kind of sense. It does. Yeah, yeah. I, I work at the computer as, as much as possible. Oh, absolutely. I don't use paper anymore at all. But you, every day you write. Every day you're at the computer writing. Well, whenever an idea comes. Yeah. Sometimes I stay up all night and just write. Yeah. <laughs> not that that's a good thing. I'm not recommending that, but I'm just saying. You know, I, I'm backlogged with ideas. You know, I started writing when I was like six or seven years old. I haven't stopped. Most people no longer do what they did as children. So I had a lot of trouble thinking of what I wanted to become because I didn't want to become what I already was. So I had to become something else. I was a writer. And, and you see, so that, that made it hard for, for, for my teachers because I'm already, 
I hated those assignments when you're supposed to write like someone else. I would not do it because I did not want to write like someone else. Absolutely not. I refused to do them. I remember in elementary school, I just simply did not do them. I would think, I have no intention of writing like someone. I was bad. I was very bad. I didn't do those assignments. I wanted to write like myself, whatever that was. And I, I hated that. I'll tell you what I didn't like about um, being a, a graduate writing student when you had to share your work. Because I didn't, and what I mean by that, I didn't mind sharing, but I didn't want invitations from others to correct the work. Whatever mistakes there were, I wanted to find them myself. <laughs> and so my work was never discussed. <laughs> I wouldn't allow it because I wanted to have the torture, the pleasure, whatever it was. I wanted it myself. Well, that's a very interesting question. I can't say what inspires me the most because I'm inspired by, by anything. And I don't want to start, we could, you know, we could start talking about these, these folding chairs. And if I think about it long enough, that'll lead me to write something and I don't want to write about these chairs, but evidently I'm going to since I've said it. <laughs> but that reminds me of, you know, when I, I went to, to Vassar College and Vassar invited me as a limited fork theorist. And it's um, very rare that I get invited as that. And it was wonderful for me to be with a group, with groups of people who knew what that was and who had studied it. And, and so you see, and I explained when, when I got there, uh, because I had some, some prepared video. When you get a chance, go to my web website called the Mid-Hudson Taffy Company. It's all about my visit to Vassar. Okay, so what happened there? I had some students, um, and it was important that they not know in advance that they were going to do this. I needed students who were willing to just go along with whatever it was. I met them on the day I got there. And then I had to know that they were willing. And so I assigned one to play the chairs in the auditorium. I si assigned another one to make some other kind of noise. They each had a word, they thought of the words, and at random, they would say the words. Or when I pointed to them, they would say the words. Eventually, I just said, whenever you feel like it, say, say your word, and they were singing them. It was wonderful, and I wanted them to mingle with the audience because I wanted the audience to participate. I wanted cell phones to ring because that was additional sound. So you see, I wasn't trying to keep anything quiet. Go to that website. I have to come back. Yes. And it's also the integration of anything else because you see, the dress was made by hand. I wanted the tactile to be part of it. All of the senses involved. That was important to me, you see. And so, so we ended up, so students would make all kinds of things. I have somewhere photographs of some of the projects they made. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. But getting back to, to, to being at Vassar, and so these students would say the words, so you see. Now, so I'm playing the prepared video, and I had to get their technicians to understand that I wanted it to spill. There were three screens, and so you see, two, two screens are showing the prepared video. However, I did not want them synchronized. And I pointed out that after 15 minutes or so, I wanted them to play back what we had already done so we would have to interact with what had been happening with, and, and move forward from there. Now, at the end of all this, it wasn't over, and and mind you, the audience is participating, and the three student volunteers are going into the audience to get them to say things. And so I'm, you know, I'm invited to be the, the Elizabeth Bishop speaker, and so I talk, I, 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 I'm, I'm reading her poem, The Fish. And somewhere in, well, anyway, so at the end of this, so now we're interacting with what is being played back as we try to move forward. And it ends up as this, some kind of crazy song. You'll hear that at the mid Hudson Taffy Company. Now, I do something else. So you see, so I'm collecting, I have three tapes coming 
from um, the technicians who found, and it, it was so funny because when I tried to explain that I wanted it to spill, and finally one of them said, you mean like Don Cage? I said, absolutely, any outcome is an outcome. It doesn't matter what it is. I just trusted that we would have one. I'm lucky it worked. <laughs> but it was absolutely gorgeous. So now I'm taking these, these tapes home from, from the filming. And so now I do something else. I make 19 songs. All of them incorporate the full um, 45 minutes of the lecture, the full lecture. Sometimes I played it backwards, I sped it up, I slowed it down, but, and I added vocals. So you will hear, whether or not I could sing, it doesn't matter. I was willing to do it. There must be a willingness. It doesn't matter if you do it well, as long as you are willing. You have to be, you have to take a chance. You have to take that risk. It doesn't, I didn't, I don't, I didn't know if I could do these things, but I wanted to try. It became necessary to try. <laughs> and that's what made all the difference. Mid Hudson Taffy Company. Oh, and after I made the songs, I uploaded them on the website. Anybody can go there and download the songs for free. Not that they're good songs, but they're there. <laughs> It has been for me, but be careful with, with certain chemicals, you know. <laughs> be very careful. I mean, there, 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 there are some things that, I don't know, you know, you just want to be careful. You, you, want to, you, you want to have some, if you know these things don't mix or that it could be an explosion, be careful. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> trial and error, yeah. Okay, sure. Whew. Medicine, no. We, I mean, there are some things where you don't want trial and error. I mean, I know it had to be that way in the beginning, but we, we've learned a lot since then, you know. So, no, no trial and error there. <laughs> I, I, I recommend learning in, in those areas. It's, it's just necessary because trial and error could be, could be fatal. Yes. I have a question. You know, I, I, want, you know, I wish that in the university we didn't have, um, you know, set schedules. I mm -hmm. wish we didn't have grading. You know, I wish we could just... Well, you see, what I did about grading? What did you do with grading with your... I graded the plans, not the finished product, which is, they did not have to have. Just the plans. The plans had to be extremely detailed. That's why I needed students who were willing to work, because the plan was, what do you want to learn? You don't know about it? Go where you... If you wanted to, 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 to learn about... If, if it was something involving physics, go to that area where there are people who have more expertise than I had, you know. And, and so students would often just go off, but they had to let me know where they would be. I'm going to be here. They'd, and I, I'd want something signed that they really did that, that they did the work. You can see why it was so important that I only had students who were going to work. That's why I, I encouraged as many to drop as possible on the first day, and they did. And was, was that a graduate course? Or no, undergraduate. Okay, very interesting. How many did you end up with after the 20. Uh, initially, like 50 would come. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and then of those, uh, even more would drop. Many of them did not believe me that this was a place where they would not be penalized for trying things. I had to make them understand that there were no penalties for trying. There were penalties for not trying. They had to believe me. And it was unusual because I'm the only professor telling them this. You know, and, and they're thinking, well, in my other classes I'm hearing this, but I'm telling them something different. So I, I did have to spend some time getting them to understand I was not like that. You know. And eventually, <laughs> many of them believed me. Thank you very much, It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I want to thank President Verinder Modgill for being here as well. Thank you very much.
And um, we do have books to sign here. Thylis is going to stay here for a while, so please come down and talk to her personally. And then for those of you who are part of the Network Detroit Conference as well, there's, um, you can head on over to the management building, just right out the glass doors and then the building to the right. And there's some lunch waiting for you outside of M218. The University of Michigan has a um, book display. The University of Michigan Press is here with their digital humanities books. And um, we'll be starting our panels up around 1 o'clock. So thank you very much. And Melinda, would you put Barl down there too? And I'm going to come down.